recording, I did a mini cube start and the cluster started up OK. Actually, I was rehearsing this yesterday and I did a mini cube start and there was a horrible big error. So I had to do a mini cube stop followed by a mini cube start. So please don't worry if that happens to you. I've also done a kubectl get all. I know I mentioned this a bit earlier in the course, but we don't have to do anything special to restart the pods and the services that we had running before. They just automatically restart, which is why you can see now that my first pod has now restarted twice and my second pod has restarted once. And you can see that they're a couple of days old now because uh, I did the previous recordings a couple of days ago. But the services are still there, so we can visit the web app on 30,080. So we'll start by getting a pod deployed for this uh, for this queue. And first decision really is we have this file called firstpod.yaml. And that really could do with being renamed by now because that, cont that file contains the pods for our web app. So I could call it webapppod.yaml. But actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to put all of my pod definitions into that single file. There's no rules in Kubernetes as to what you put in these YAML files and you can slice them up in any way that you like. Now, of course, if I had a thousand pods in this system, I wouldn't be putting a thousand pods into a single file. You would need to divide those files up in some way that you choose. But certainly when you're starting, when you've got, say, fewer than 10 pods, then a single YAML file for all of your pods is just fine. So I'll start with a rename, first of all. So I'll move that first pod.yaml into a file called, I'll just go for pods.yaml. We can edit it as usual in any text editor. I'm not keen on copying and pasting, but really... If I take the pod definition for release zero of the web app, I'll paste that down at the bottom. Don't forget you will need a document separator if you've got more than one pod definition in a file. And we'll paste that in. So the name of this is going to be Q. Remember, this is just the name of the pod. So this is a little bit of a throwaway name because we're treating our pods like cattle and not like pets. And similarly, the app label is going to be, the label is going to be app colon Q. Now, I didn't say this in the requirements, but there's no real need for a release label on this Q because we're not going to be changing the Q. It really doesn't matter about having labels on them. And then the all important container, the name of the container can be Q and the image is going to be Kiatus, <laughs> Kiatus, or Kiatus, dash Fleetman, dash Q, colon, release one. And I think for the pods, it's as simple as that. Now, while I'm here, I might as well do the same job for the service. And in a very similar vein, we have currently a file called webapp-service.yaml. I'm going to rename that to be just services.yaml. And now we can put all the services for the course in there. So in my editor then, and yeah, another copy and paste job, I think. I don't like copying and pasting, but these files are not the easiest things to do from the top of your head. So let's review everything here. It's still going to be a service this time. The name of the service will be Fleetman-Q. Now I didn't tell you what to call this queue. So for now at least, it really doesn't matter what you've called the queue you would need a project standard for this. And I think I did mention previously that we'll make the project standard be the standard label Fleetman for the project, followed by a dash, followed by the same label that we're using for the pod name. Now, if you've done something different there, it doesn't matter for now, but actually when we go forward with the course and we do some networking, then this will become very relevant when we're networking. But for now, it doesn't matter too much. So then for the selector, the selector this time is just the app name, which is Q. For this service, we don't need the release label as a selector. And then for the ports, as I said in the introduction, it's 8161 for Apache ActiveMQ. And then we need to set up a node port, of course. And as I said, you can choose any number in the 30,000 range, anything up to about 32,000. So we'll go for 30010. 
really doesn't matter what you go for there. Now we need to apply those files and you could do a kubectl apply dash f and just do that to each file each file in turn but a little trick here that you'll find very useful if you've got lots of these yaml files is you can just do a kubectl apply dash f followed by a dot and that will apply all the yaml files it finds in that directory if nothing's changed in those files it will just go unchanged. Now I'm seeing here pod Q unchanged purely because I did a rehearsal off camera just to make sure this was working. And as it happened, I had an error in my Q. It was just a minor typing error. And uh, so I had to re-record that. But that's why it's telling me that the Q has been created. Of course, if I were to recall that command and run it again, it would just run through no errors, but nothing would be changed. So I hope that worked for you and we can do a kubectl get all now and I can see my new service here fleetman q. Now I suppose before we run to the browser it would be worthwhile checking the pod is running. So let's do a kubectl describe and we'll need to say that we are describing a pod and then the name of the pod is q. And just what I'm looking for there is to make sure that the pull happens successfully and that it's gone through the creating and started stage. So all of that looks good. Let's go to a browser then. So as usual, it's the Minikube IP address and this time colon 30,010. And wonderful, we are on the active MQ console. Now I did give you a username and password, but I forgot that you only need that if you click through to the manage active MQ broker. And here we are, admin, admin. And when we go a little further on this course, we'll find that this queues link here is going to be a very useful sort of diagnostics page so that we can see if our microservice architecture is running. But, but all of that's still to come. We still need to learn about replica sets and deployments, and that's what's coming next, so rejoin me for that.